Hi there, and thank you for tuning in. I just watched a really good video by James Popsis, and if you don't know him or his channel, I definitely think you should check it out. I will post a link to the video just above, so you can go and see it for yourself, and I'm not here to steal his thunder. But actually, what he said in that video got me thinking, and it's related to uh, pinhole photography. And he basically said that he had seen a camera now where he thought, stop, this, this is too advanced technology. It's invading my shooting process. It simply is too much. And he used that to reflect upon the fact that he couldn't really understand why people would want to buy a piece of technology, a camera that wasn't sort of up to the, the latest and greatest. Why would people go back to, a, a, say, an old Nikon D700? That's not the example he's giving, but still. His line of thinking was that why would people go back? And he suddenly realized that maybe it was because they wanted to be back in the process of shooting and not having sort of technology as a crutch where you use technology to almost make the, the photographer not necessary. I know it's will probably never be like that, but to a large extent. And it got me thinking that pinhole photography is perhaps a little bit the same. You want to go back to things being a little bit difficult, right? So you're shooting without a lens, you're shooting in completely darkness because you can't see a thing because you have blocked where your lens would be sitting completely, almost completely, because there is a small pinhole. But other than that, it's pitch black. So when you're trying to see anything, you can't see what you're shooting. <laughs> and you'll have to be standing there for quite a long time because you're shooting at some crazy aperture here, maybe F200. And when you're looking into the view viewfinder, you can't see anything because it's letting in so little light that, uh, yeah, it's crazy. So maybe that could be some of the reasons why you may want to pick up pinhole photography because it's going back in time, back to the days when, when technology wasn't so advanced and the photographer was really engaged in what was going on. The other main reason why I think you want to engage with pinhole photography is that it gives you images with a special look. Due to diffraction, you know, you're shooting with an aperture, say F200, you, you, will, you will not get sharp images. They will be, I wouldn't say blurred, but you, you will clearly see they are not sharp. They have a special character and uh, you are shooting in a way where because of the very narrow aperture, the, the image will be uh, sharp from front to back or sharp. It will have the same sharpness front to back. There will be almost an infinite depth of field. So it has a special look, and in my mind, it captures the structure of what you see rather than perhaps so much all the details. And that is another way of shooting, a way of capturing what's around you. And uh, I, I kind of like the images that comes out of this, and maybe you also will, will like it. So in this video, I will just be showing you how to set up your camera. I will show you some examples. And that's it. And then I will wish you good luck. Yeah. So let's get cracking. So what I've done is I've taken one of the lids you use to seal off your camera when you have no lens mounted. And then I basically just drilled a hole in the center. And uh, as you can see, it's a very small hole, but it also needs to be small. Make sure that you clean it up so there are no things left from the drilling process. It needs to be a very clean hole that uh, you produce here in the center of the lid. Next exercise is then to take a needle and punch a hole in a piece of tin foil. And uh, the smaller the better, I would say. So be careful when you punch the hole not to use any force, but just punch it with a needle and uh, that's basically it. If you are very ambitious, the side that would point towards the camera, take a pen, a permanent marker with black obviously, and paint it, or it's maybe not painting it, but Make sure it, it, it is black on that side so that the side that faces the camera is black and hence you, you minimize uh, reflections inside the camera. That is the proper way of doing it. I haven't done that, I must admit. I'm just showing you this so you can see how it's done. And speaking of doing things the right way, this is not really beautiful work, is it? I have taken some tape and just mounted the the tin foil here so that the hole is in the center. It's not a very beautiful job and I would also recommend you use tape that is not transparent. But it works, it gets the job done and uh, that's really all there is to it. If you don't like the angle of view, you can use a spacer. The further away from 
the camera, the, I wouldn't say the lens, but the pinhole gets, the more narrow your angle of view gets. So try that if you have some of these lying around and you think you're shooting too wide. I think what you will be shooting at is around the same as a lens on a full frame camera will give around 70 to 80 millimeters. But as I said, if you want a more narrow view, use a spacer. Maybe not one as big as this one, but uh, you know, one of these in principle. The camera I'm using is the Nikon D4. Uh, you can use any camera, both mirrorless and DSLRs, but uh, I would recommend maybe not your newest camera. You are actually running around with a camera with a hole in it and uh, subject to your risk profile and personal preference and all that. I mean, I would never take this combination to the beach. I have seen what salt water can do to your camera, for instance. So yeah, but they, maybe that's just me, but be mindful that you are running around here with a camera that has a hole in it. Put a piece of cloth on top of it when you put it into your, your backpack or your, your camera bag and make sure that you are mindful that this is a bit vulnerable and the dust will enter, so uh, cleaning your sensor, having that as a skill is also a good thing if you want to dive into pinhole photography. For long exposures, it's necessary to block the viewfinder so that you don't get any false light to enter. On the D4, I have a little switch here so you can see that it changes so that it blocks uh, like this. And if you don't have that, make sure to block it mechanically with some tape or whatever works for you. But you can't use the viewfinder anyway, so there's really no <laughs> problem in blocking it because you, if you look into it, it will be pitch black. You can't see a thing. So you might as well also block it here from the rear and uh, make sure no false light enters. In terms of the exposure times, you can see here I have a remote trigger. The D4 here will only allow me to go up to 30 seconds in one go. Otherwise, I'm in bulb mode meaning that I need to hold down the shutter while the exposure is going on. And sometimes you need to expose several minutes, so that could be a bit of a pain. So I use this external shutter release, and it allows me to, for instance, just push down and say, now I just want it to count. You can see here, it's counting how many seconds the shutter has been open. And uh, as soon as it reaches whatever I like, I can just release it again. I can also set up the timer so that it counts downwards. So Right now it's set to one minute and eight seconds, and uh, that also works fine. But in many cases, I, I shoot trial and error, and that's why I really like the, the bulb mode here. It has a mechanism here, you can see, so when I, when I push it down and push it forward, it stays down until I release it again, so I don't have to stand next to my camera and, and hold my finger on the shutter. In terms of how long you need the shutter to be open, uh, my experience is that you're shooting at maybe around f200 or something crazy along those lines. So you're not letting in a lot of light. If you're shooting directly into the sun, my experience is that it's around 10 seconds of exposure time. If you're shooting on an overcast day, it's between 20 and 30 seconds. If you're shooting at dusk, you are typically around two minutes. And if you're shooting at nighttime, which I have also done with, with this, you're close to four minutes. If you want to go beyond the 30 seconds or however much your camera gives you in terms of exposure time, and uh, you don't want to hold down the, the shutter for, say, two or three minutes, a little tip here is that you can use multiple exposures. And let's say that you need to have, say, 100 seconds. You can set it up so that you take five shots and then... Each shot, you set that up to be 20 seconds. Of course, you need to hit the shutter five times, but then at least you don't have to hold down the shutter for uh, 100 seconds, which can be very tiring. Uh, just make sure that auto gain is off so that uh, it accumulates the exposure and doesn't uh, sort of try to even it out. So auto gain off, and uh, you can, of course, choose as many shots as you like. The point is just that don't need to hold down the shutter uh, while uh, the ex exposure is going on uh, and you can go beyond the max limit uh, your camera has. In terms of camera settings, you can of course forget about the aperture because that's given. I would say ISO, set that to base ISO so that uh, you have as little noise as possible. Sometimes when I shoot at night, I must admit I, I crank up the ISO, but uh, I pay a price in terms of noise. With these long exposures, uh, noise just, in my experience, gets worse. So keep it at base ISO if you have the patience. That would be my advice. 
And then shutter speed, that is, as I said, between somewhere between 10 seconds and many, many minutes. And of course, you shoot in manual mode. The final thing I want to mention is white balance because your camera gets so little light that the automatic white balance probably doesn't work. And uh, therefore, it can be an idea to set up the white balance if you want to get it right in camera. I shoot in RAW, so I can do a lot of, of tweaking in post, but be aware that maybe setting the white balance manually could be a good idea before you start shooting. We have a new member of the family and she is not willing to sit still for very long. So with the long exposures required for pinhole photography, that is not a good subject. Then we have instead an older member of the family and he is more willing to sit still. But as you can see, even he sometimes thinks it's getting too much and decides to leave the shoot in the middle of the exposure. Here a scene from my living room and notice how the light in the foreground is just as sharp as the stuff in the background. And this is very typical for a pinhole picture because of the very narrow aperture. You will see that the, the depth of field is extreme and that almost everything appears to be, if not sharp, then equally blurred. Here a scene from my kitchen and I think it shows that Ordinary things and ordinary scenes looks a little bit more interesting with pinhole photography and going a little bit closer to the sun in the window. You can see here, this is shot directly into the sun. And I like the fact that it's actually difficult to figure out what is going on here. It requires a little bit more from the viewer. The same goes for this image, which is just an image of a lamp. But again, it becomes a little bit more interesting because of the way the images with pinhole photography look. As mentioned, if you crank up the ISO, you will get more noisy pictures, which can also be an expression in itself. But if you don't like that, the remedy is to stay at base ISO, which will give you clean images even at night, provided you let the shutter stay open sufficiently long, of course. That's it from me. I'll leave you with the image from the thumbnail. I hope this video was useful. As always, happy shooting. Take care. Bye-bye.